Hello and welcome to 2020 Politics War Room with James Carville. I'm Al Hunt here in Washington. James is back in the Shenandoah now. And we're proud partners with the Sign Institute at American University. Don't forget to subscribe to 2020 Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. James, we have a couple terrific guests today. Howard French, a professor at the Columbia Journalism School, was a distinguished foreign correspondent for the New York Times in Africa, Tokyo, and China, a photographer and an author. He has written about um, not only just foreign policy, but about race in America and particularly about race in journalism. Howard, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Howard, we're going to get to our profession of journalism in a moment. But tell me your your sense of the reaction to the murder of George Floyd and other racial incidents. Are we seeing some kind of real seminal change or will it more likely be ephemeral like the protest after Mikey, Michael Brown or Freddie Gray or countless others? Well, um, I write a column for a little outfit called the World Politics Review, and that's the topic of my my, my item for this week. And and I go back and forth on this question. Um, you know, um, I cite a piece that ran in The New Yorker this week by a guy named Jelani Cobb, who, who calls this uh, the American Spring, taking from, the, of course, the phrase the Arab Spring. Uh, right. And suggesting that there's something quite deep taking place here. And others have been... I would just interrupt to say the Arab Spring didn't end as well as. as oh no, it didn't end as well. Ended. You know, I'm a yeah. little, I'm a little more hopeful than uh, about the ending of this than than, than that. But uh, putting that aside, um, others have said um, uh, that this is uh, our third reconstruction. The first reconstruction being the Capital R reconstruction. The second one being the Civil Rights Movement, and and the third, if this is what we're living through, being a kind of revisiting of the civil rights era and the, the, the very many items of unfinished business that remain for us. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not a gushing optimist, but I don't think that that is necessarily out of the reach realm of possibility. I think that uh, there has been a, you know, a surprising um, firing of the imagination of lots of young non-African American people about the state of injustice in this society and and its and and its thoroughgoing manifestations in almost every corner of life, and I think that the conversations that 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 these recent weeks have generated will leave lasting effects. Now, how, how completely they will transform American society is a big open question, and and I don't think they're going to finish all of the unfinished business by any means. But but I think this is important, and I don't think it's going to be. Um, ephemeral. I mean, I, this morning I heard on NPR um, talk about um, the uh, shooting, the mass killing in, in Charleston five years ago at the Manual Baptist Church. And, and, and first of all, I was shocked that that was five years ago. Secondly, I was shocked that that wasn't itself the occasion for the thing that we're talking about now. Uh, but the fact that it wasn't and the fact that we're having this depth and breadth of conversation today tells me that there's something much more uh, potentially transformative about this moment's politics around race in the country. Howard, what's your impression or impressions of the coverage of this and uh, major news media? Um, you know, we've gone through phases. Um, the early phases were, I think, um, somewhat uh, timid and reluctant to sort of dive in with, um, you know, both feet. Um, uh, second phase has been, you know, you open the Washington Post just to take one example, and, and I don't mean to call them out by, by any means, um, but uh, I, I happen to have read the Washington Post last today and read it every morning. And and essentially the, the front page and much of the newspaper is 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 full of, of coverage that's related. Um, uh, and I think that there's a kind of, I wonder about this. Uh, you know, on the one hand, this is a response to neglect of these issues by the major mainstream media for so long. Uh, on the other hand, there's a kind of me too feeling that one sometimes gets. Um, and that makes me uneasy because Me Too moments pass quickly. Um, and I would rather 
um, a patient, slow, deliberate, and really, really thoughtful um, approach to this topic uh, than an effusive sort of flood of stuff. And then a kind of, well, we've been there and we've done that feeling that the press congratulates itself as it turns the page and, and its attentions to other topics in the very near future. Yeah, James will jump in. I mean, let me ask one more. You wrote several years ago um, a really interesting piece about, I think you call it the whiteness of American journalism, the paucity of African-Americans in both top roles, you know, editors, uh, Dean Bacay and Lester Holt today are the exceptions, and also uncovering broader stories like national security or politics. Has that changed over the last three or four years, or could this be the driving force to compel that sort of change? It has not changed. Um, the the latest data that I've seen, uh, you know, these the the uh, um, staffing patterns don't res- don't don't respond to the day's news, right? So I don't expect since uh, you know just in the last month or six weeks that that one will have seen a meaningful change in terms of the way um, American media are staffed racially speaking. Um, but the thesis of my piece, or one of the main arguments of that piece, which was in the Guardian uh, long reads section of, in, in England, uh, and was called The Enduring Whiteness of the American Media, is that um, we have seen a very grudging, and I mean over the course of a generation even, or more perhaps, uh, acceptance of blacks in certain kinds of roles in the media. Uh, sports was probably the first, or maybe racial Urban affairs, as it was euphemistically called, was probably the first. When, when the Post and the Times and other major media uh, responded to um, uh, the civil rights movement and riots and urban centers in, in the United States in the 1960s, uh, sort of with the realization that they had no black staffers that they could send out into these areas, that white, partly because the white staffers perceived being in those areas was dangerous, right? And so they begin to hire urban affairs people. And it becomes, it begins to be okay for black people to write about race as a, as a kind of breaking news topic, not as a news analysis topic initially, at least. Um, and then you gradually see a change where blacks are then recruited to write about sports because blacks are highly represented in sports. So you have urban affairs and then you have sports and then uh, more gradually and a little more grudgingly, grudgingly you, you allow blacks and other p- p- representatives of minority groups to come into more analytical functions regarding race and society. And, and we're sort of still stuck in that mode right now today where we have not arrived is, is systematically integrating people of, uh, who, you know, minority group members into uh, areas of coverage that are not in the popular imagination typically associated with associated wrongly, I would say, with um, uh, the fact of one's racial identity. In other words, as you said, national security or business or or national politics. Um, uh, until very recently, representation in the White House press corps among minority group members was very low. Or um, uh, international affairs and foreign correspondence. Um, and, and, and incorporating minority group members in these areas does two things. One, one of them is this is the only way that you will raise the, the, the real meaningfully raise the numbers of, of, of African Americans and other minorities in the media, because if you limit them only to sports and, 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 and this thing that I called urban affairs, well, that's always going to be a little corner of the news business. So Integrating them throughout the whole range of topics is is a way of raising the numbers systematically, but it is also a way of changing the orientation of the media in terms of the way it thinks about and writes about and assesses and analyzes the society. Because the, the one of the most important purposes of having minorities be in the press isn't just so that you can say we ticked off a box of diversity. It is also to say that we have allowed other points of view to enter into the picture and to fertilize or to to oxygenate uh, our own sense as a society, what it means to be American and what it means to be p- a part of this big, broad world. And to do so, it can't simply be a white perspective all the time, which is what it has almost always been. I think when the historians cover this, the video that that young girl or woman, I think she was 17 years old, so I'm not sure what to call it, but that young person took Black folks knew what this was like. I think it, the real difference it made was on white opinion. Like, 
oh my God, look how casual this is. I mean, you know, to Freddie Gray and guy died to put him in the back of a police van. It didn't, it just, when, when this thing appeared, you could feel the shockwave. And I, I, the day it happened, I think, of, I was fortunate New York Times called me and I, I, I made the video really had and continues to have a real effect on white opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we go back and unearth this, I, th I think that video is going to be up there with, you know, important documents of, in American history. I really do. Uh, at least that's from my vantage point. Uh, you agree with that, Howard? Well, James, I would like to juxtapose that video and, and the, uh, uh, the killing uh, that took place um, in Atlanta most recently and the Minneapolis uh, killing um, with those nine minutes of kneeling on a guy's neck with the, the, um, the, the massacre at Emmanuel Baptist Church in, in, in Charleston that I evoked a little bit earlier in our conversation. Um, uh, black journalists at the time um, were noting uh, that uh, the, the the extraordinary means uh, applied by the police in arresting I can't remember the young man's name who committed that massacre um, Dylan Roof Dylan Roof there you go uh, the the sort of deference that the police showed to Dylan Roof um, treating him you know the as as the first officer approached him in the, his car he actually holstered his pistol um, and um, how um, the other officers surrounding the car backed up sort of uh, kind of almost in an act of graciousness as Dylan Roof was was led out of his car. They backed up and gave him space. Um, they brought him Burger King in jail, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this idea that white people should be shocked at something that happened in the last week or two, um, in some, you know, on one level, I understand it. You know, the, the, the killing in Minneapolis was just so... Um, atrocious that any human being had to be shocked by it but the idea that white people in it took until that event in 2020 to realize the ugliness of this sort of thing in america strikes me as a kind of willful blindness because we're surrounded by this stuff all the time and there's recurrence of it and it's not just how blacks are treated uh, in isolated events like this it's a kind of systematic treatment of blacks as and that has to be juxtaposed with the, the very, very different systematic treatment of whites. Like nobody can imagine a Freddie Gray happening to a white guy. Nobody can imagine a Lloyd George happening to a white guy. Nobody can imagine what happened in Atlanta happening to a white guy. It's just, it's, it's almost literally unimaginable. And so, you know, I, I think we need to get over the shock. I think we're past, we, we ha we're, like, like that moment has passed. It's time to actually sit up and to think, um, you know, unemotionally about this and to say, you know, this has been going on for a really long time. And if I wasn't aware, it's because I wouldn't allow myself to be aware of it. I think people were aware. The, the, the thing that the video struck is just how casual it was. I, I mean, I think that had... A, a real effect that it, it just seemed the guy was just, it was so ordinary and it took so long. And I, I just think it had a, a, a effect that other, you're right, horrible, terrible, systemic, historic, you name it, this changed something. And it, I, I agree. It should have changed a long time ago. Uh, but, I think this had a real, a real effect, a deep, and I hope it lasts. Let me ask y'all as journalists, the, the two of you. So you're the editor of the paper in New Orleans during the Confederate Monuments controversy. By the way, you, you, without those monuments, those monuments being down, I actually saved lives. I would not have wanted to see what happened in the aftermath uh, of, of the Floyd murder had they still been up. But how would you, would, and it was fierce, was white resistance to this. I mean, it really was. And it wasn't just yahoos. They were, you know, 
respected community members, in quotations. <laughs> like as a journalist, if you, if the two of you were the editor, would would you allow a, a op-ed column defending the monuments? How would, would you assign? How, how would how would the two of you handle have handled that story? Because it does seem to me that there was a, a, a really right side and a really wrong side in this argument. Yeah, um, you know, if if I may go first, I I, I would just may perhaps start by objecting to the notion of yahoos. It not only being yahoos. I mean, I think that the so-called upstanding, you know, uh, well-to-do, well-educated citizens of of uh, typically southern communities who stand up for you know monuments toward uh, Confederate war criminals are also yahoos you know why should we defer to them because they have money or they live in nice houses or that they have you know they speak english well or in ways that appeal to us you know um, they're yahoos too um uh, that's perpetuating a kind of mythic notion of the of the south that i don't think holds up right um they are just as much of a problem as the guys who drive pickup trucks and have shotguns um uh and uh, I think we have to get past that. Um, my, you know, as I, having said that, I think you won't be surprised if I say that now that if I were a newspaper editor, I think that um, we have to say an ed- in, in assigning an editorial, there's room for an op-ed that says, let's go slowly on this. Let's um, consider uh, you know, the fullness of history and that, you know, you can't go back and change the way things were. You know, I'm not personally persuaded by those sorts of arguments, but a newspaper needs to allow a variety of opinion. However, the newspaper's own editorial, if I'm the, the head of the editorial page, has to be absolutely clear in its moral stance about these things and 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 can't kind of equivocate. It has to say, you know, the Confederacy was not a lost cause, it was a bad cause. And it was, it stood for something evil. And that evil was bondage of black people. The, the principal heroes of the Confederacy, uh, as celebrated in those statues, wanted perpetual bondage, bondage of black people. It wasn't a temporary thing. It was, this was the nature of things. Black people are meant to be the servants of white people. We have to be clear about in our condemnation of that, even if we allow you know, on the op-ed side of the page, the occasional voice who says there's another way of thinking about this. So, uh, I mean, when that happened, I, there were, a, you know, there were a lot of columns in it. And I, I, it's hard for me to think of a movement that has been more destructive than the lost cause. I was very fortunate. I was particularly well-educated as a history undergraduate because we had T. Harry Williams and other faculty members that just never bought into that at all. Mm-hmm. But the effects of the lost cause, you still hear people spouting that that kind of stuff. I mean, that we have not totally killed that monster. Sure. Well, we have three people speaking together here, all who have roots in the South. And so we're, we're all, through personal experience, keenly aware of that. And that makes it all the more important, I think, in, an, in answer to your question about if you're the newspaper editor, why you can't waver about this. You have to take up your courage and say what is wrong is wrong and be clear about that. Yeah, I, I would weigh in, James, and say that if I, I'm, I'm largely in agreement with Howard, if I had been the editor of the New Orleans paper, I would not have run a column that defended the lost cause, that defended Confederacy. Uh, I, I think that's Totally on. I mean, that's like, you know, would you run a column, you know, that's anti-Semitic? Uh, the answer is, of course, no. You know, I might run a column, as I think Howard said, although he'd have reservations about it, of, you know, let's go slowly on this for whatever reasons and then write a strong editorial. But let's go. Let's let's take it to today, Howard. Um, the New York Times and the Tom Cotton column. A, should they have run it? And B, uh, after they then backed down, should they have fired the uh, the editor? Um I don't think it, they should have run it, and not because the subject itself was taboo. I think uh, the, that um, the editing was was shoddy, and I don't only mean in the sense that, as James Bennett and his deputy claimed after the fact, not to have read it prior to publication, but shoddy in the sense that the editors failed to follow up with Cotton on uh, things that he had said via Twitter and elsewhere 
publicly that were even more extreme on the same topic, but even more extreme than that. And a good editor should say to somebody who tones something down, um, unbelievably, the Tom Cotton thing was toned down by Tom Cotton for the New York Times. Well, so you're presenting this thing that's cleaned up for our audience. Isn't what you really mean what you have said in some other venue in public? I don't think the editors performed that task. And I think that that was part of their duty. And in, in not doing that, I think, they, I think they failed their duty. On the question of whether Bennett should have been fired, um, you know, I, I'm, I've, I, it's been a, more than a decade since I left the Times, and I'm not very close to the, to the, it was never very close to the op-ed or to the opinion section. But I'm not really sure to what extent fired is the exact right word for it. I think that Bennett knew that he had lost the confidence of his staff. I think that the publisher and owner of the newspaper knew that he risked losing um, the confidence of his staff. And I think that the situation simply became untenable for Bennett in ways that Bennett himself understood. And although I don't know what the conversation between Bennett and uh, what the conversation between Bennett and Salzberger was like, I can imagine a situation in which Bennett himself essentially walked away from the job. Well, let me ask you what might even be a tougher one. Uh, the Washington Post, Marty Barron, I think everyone agrees, is one of the really distinguished, great newspaper editors in America. Wes Lowry, uh, most everyone will agree, is one of the brightest young reporters in America, an African-American. Uh, Marty Barron is white. Uh, uh, he, Lowry, forever since Ferguson, had done some terrific pieces, prize-winning pieces for the Post. And it came to a head some months ago when Marty Barron said, you have to stop tweeting out uh, stuff about some of these injustices. And I think I'm oversimplifying. Uh, uh, Lowry's answer was, hey, I'm a citizen. This isn't on the one hand, on the other hand, so journalism. This is moral clarity. This is outrageous. Uh, so you had a great conflict there. Uh, what was your take on it? As someone who uses Twitter quite freely, um, I'm not affiliated in, in a staff kind of way with any particular publication, so I have great leeway in that sense. Um, I have mixed feelings about this. I mean, I enjoy my freedom on Twitter and in other venues. I enjoy my, you know, I'm a tenured professor at Columbia University now, and I, I you know, I write as a freelancer and write whatever I want to say with very little kind of hesitation. Um, in expressing myself. And I, uh, that's a great luxury and one that uh, I, I treasure. Um, but I understand the, let's depersonalize this for a moment. I don't, uh, you know, I'm even further away from the Marty Baron, uh, West Lowry situation. But um, as, as a matter of principle, I understand a newspaper or a publication having an editorial policy which says to its reporting staff that um, we expect you, your job is to cover the news in, in, the, in a, the conventionally kind of defined sense of striving for objectivity. Uh, and the, the search for objectivity uh, or, or our image uh, as upholding the search for objectivity can be damaged by taking, uh, you know, blunt stands about uh, affairs of the day uh, out, uh, off of outside of our pages. And therefore, we ask you to restrict yourself in the following sense. Now, so I think the principle of a publication being able to do that is fine uh, if the rules are clearly defined and if they are applied to everyone. Uh, I don't know to the extent, uh, the extent to which the Post's rules were clearly defined. And I also don't know whether they were, you know, applied evenly to every member of the Post staff. Um, and so, that's where the rub comes, I think. You know, I don't, I don't know if, if uh, Lowry felt that he was being singled out um, or not. Um, uh, but let's assume that's not the case, which, you know, and again, I have no information about this matter. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't think that it's wrong for a publication to say we have an editorial policy about tweeting and here's what it is. You sign up for this if you want to write for us, and if you don't want to sign up for this, then you can't write for us. So it strikes me that, that there are, to any observer, there are way too few African-Americans in journalism. All right, I happen to teach at the Manship School at LSU, and our campus is 
I, would, I wouldn't brag on, it's not a number to brag on, but I think we're trying to approach like 15% of our student body. It's 12 and moving up, uh, African-Americans. And we are, journalism is part of it. We have communications, public relations, graphic design, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, and I had, a, I've, I've taught more young African-Americans than most college professors just because I teach at LSU and I'm not giving us a, a, any kind of a star for diversity, but we're pretty diverse. But I can't recall if any of my students were really going into journalism. And it, it looks to me like, is there any program to recruit these young people to, because it, whatever you think of the profession, it, it requires a certain skill set and it requires training to enter it. Is there any effort that, that you're aware of that encourages these young people to get into journalism? Most people look at it as a dying profession. They see the, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a talented young African-American, I see the newspapers are getting thinner and making less money, you know, TV journalism, local TV journalism actually is a pretty diverse place because they obviously do it, I'm sure, more for commercial reasons than idealistic reasons. But what what do you say? How do you get more people, more young people of color in to study journalism? Um, let me just say, first of all, that uh, journalism is not um, unique uh, um, in the, the sense of a profession that lacks diversity. Uh, if you look at professional life in the United States across the board, uh, I think the uh, professions that are highly diverse are the exception, not the rule. Um, and so this isn't, uh, at the first level, a problem simply of journalism. It's a problem of social justice in the United States and a problem uh, where we have to ask your question about every profession in the United States, uh, or else we're just simply not thinking about equity in this society. Uh, so the second cut of your question, what can we do in journalism? Um, I think I could offer a few things. I mean, one of them is, um, you know, uh, some, uh, it, it is true that journalism is a profession, especially um, sort of legacy uh, aspects of journalism, like print, which I made my career in, are not seen as avenues toward wealth and prosperity by any means in this country. Um, and that the, as an industry, it's, it would appear to be still struggling since ever since, you know, the, the, the economic crisis of 2008 and the future still seems quite uncertain. And so it, it forces, it, it, it faces a kind of problem of attraction that um, across the board, I teach at a graduate school of journalism. Um, I, you know, I might get in trouble for saying this, but our student body is composed uh, in its majority of a combination of international students who, from all over the world, who sort of pay uh, cash for 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 high end uh, journalism education and relatively affluent uh, American students whose families can afford to pay for their, their children to get a journalism education and don't have to worry implicitly too much about their employment prospects or their survival, economically speaking. So, so right off the bat, you face, a, you, you can see the beginnings of a real sy systemic problem in terms of involving, interesting and involving members of minority groups from this society in, in this career. Um, uh, we offer scholarships. Um, Big media corporations offer internships of various kinds, but we've been doing that for a very long time, and it's clearly not adequate to the task of diversity that's before us. And so, what can we? What what remains to be done? Um, I remember um, early in my time at the New York Times, I was hired at the Times in 1986. A. M. Rosenthal was the editor in chief, uh, and he was succeeded by Max um, uh, um, Frankel and Joe Lelyveld. Uh, and there was a saying um, attributed to Joe Lelyveld. I'm not sure if he actually said this, but but anyway, this was the kind of word of the newsroom that the Times was looking for, you know, uh, the, the the 
the the black Babe Ruth, or you know, the, that we had to go out and hire the absolute best person uh, in order to justify any kind of anything that could be sort of um, uh, spoken of by uh, eventually by critics as affirmative action. We have to go out and and just hire people who can hit endless home runs for the New York Times if we're going to go hire minorities. Um, Lully Vettel didn't have a racist bone in his body, but I think this was a misguided view of things. And this kind of narrowing of the entrance gate of journalism at a high, at high end journalism like the New York Times saying that you only hire black people if they're like a known, known to be a star in, ahead of time is a standard that was never applied to a white person ever. That most of the white people at the New York Times or at any newspaper are almost by definition not stars. Um, and so, so you know, a, a different kind of standard needs to be applied where you have to, you, you have to play percentages. You have to know that you're going to have to hire 10 people in order to get a Babe Ruth. You know, to get a Babe Ruth, you have to hire a thousand people. Um, but, but you have to have patience and you have to nurture people and you have to, you know, the times uh, is at the very pinnacle of the kind of food chain uh, in, in, at least in, in print journalism of the United States. Um, and it can afford to sort of poach talent from other newspapers. Um, but this is not a process that widens the pool in terms of African-American or other minority representation in the media because we're simply, or they are simply taking uh, this, a, a, a black person among a small uh, universe of black people from one publication and bringing them to the Times. The Times and other elite publications have to reach down lower, have to get people straight out of school. They have to be able to take, uh, you be willing to take much more risk be willing to be much more patient and saying, look, you know, this person isn't going to step in and be, you know, a superstar necessarily in his or her first year in the job. We're going to have to hire 100 people in order to get 10 people who become, you know, who who who, who become real standouts. Um, and but that since that's what we've always done with white people, why shouldn't we do it with other people? H Howard, I agree. We had the same experience at the Wall Street Journal. I, I think it has to, to be all encompassing, pervasive, and start even before that. One of the things, this is 15 years ago, I ran a little foundation for Dow Jones, the Dow Jones Newspaper Fund. And one of the things that we started doing, boy, just, we, you know, we should have done so, I wish we could have done so much more. We found out that so many inner city high schools had eliminated their newspapers because of budget cuts. And we went to five or six schools, uh, Chicago and New York and Newark and Washington, and we used our resources and we started high school newspapers. I, I think if you, you know, you have to get more people at the top, but you also have to get more people coming up from the bottom to be able to make those choices you're talking about. And I think the industry has really not done very much about that. But um, let's hope it changes. Y you've been a terrific guest. I know we've taken more of your time than I promised. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I, I have, whenever you're coming back to Orange County, let me know and we'll go down there and we'll tour some of those places and talk about it. Have a little wine. I like that idea. <laughs>Hey, James, there are plenty of good political journalists, but there's a handful when mentioned you automatically read their piece. Ron Brownstein is in that starting five. Uh, in brief, he was the chief political correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. In the 90s, he's done other big jobs. He's now the editorial director for The Atlantic, the best expert in American politics on demographics, voting patterns, and substantive issues. Uh, that dominate our politics. Ron, welcome to the show with two old hacks. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. I, I feel that, I feel that the natural order of things is, is is somewhat inverted here. I should be asking you questions, but let's go. Yeah, but you you, you may know more. Listen, we have made it quite. We're convinced, and uh, you perhaps agree that barring an unforeseen cataclysm, Joe Biden is in a commanding position to win this election. But even if you basically agree that layout, as only you could, how short of stealing it, Trump might win in November. Well, I mean, I think it's it's the same scenario that, that there's always been. I think there's almost no chance of Trump winning the popular vote. Uh, and we can talk for later about the implications of uh, Republicans losing the popular vote in every presidential election 
uh, you know, since 1992, except for one. Uh, uh, but even if he loses the popular vote, it, it would seem to me that if he can recover a few points, he can get in position where he could hold on to Wisconsin, Florida, and Arizona by tiny margins each uh, and squeeze out an electoral college uh, victory. Um, particularly if uh, the um, coronavirus and the uncertain enthusiasm for Biden among young people skews the turnout uh, in his direction. I think he has to recover in his overall standing in the national vote for that to be a realistic scenario. But if he can get back to his 46 percent of the vote or 45 uh, that he that he won in 2016, it is at least conceivable that he could win very narrowly in those three states. I don't see him holding Pennsylvania or especially Michigan under almost any circumstance. And I don't see him winning any of the 20 states that Clinton won. Um, And that means that he can't lose anything else. And, And so it comes down to the one possibility of him holding those three by tiny margins. Well, 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 let's let me talk about the electoral college for a moment. I have a friend who's a data freak who goes through all this all the time, was going through it the other day. L- let me tell you what his conclusion is. I think agreeing with you that if Trump, you know, won, lost the elect, lost the popular vote by a point or so, once you get beyond two, it's hard. Conceivably, not likely he could win the electoral college. But 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 this analysis would say if Biden wins by four or five points, he's going to carry the blue wall, probably including Wisconsin as well as North Carolina and Arizona and maybe Florida. And if he wins by as much as 10, he's going to carry all those plus Georgia, Ohio and Iowa. And it would really be considered, you know, something approaching a landslide. Yes. Yes. Well, no, look, I, yeah, the electoral college is not completely immune to what's happening uh, in the, in the national, uh, you know, current Uh, the voters move in similar directions in different States. uh, Meaning that if, you know, if, if Donald Trump's margin among non-college women goes from roughly 25 to 30 points uh, in 2016, down to something like five or even, even in 2020, Wisconsin is not going to enormously vary from that. I mean, that you're going to see comparable movement everywhere. And one thing that seems to me, now I have not done the data on this, but, but it seems to me very logical that a Biden lead in the national popular vote may be more evenly distributed than we have seen across the states than for other Democrats for this reason. Um, Biden, you know, Biden's in, in an unusual position where so far he is somewhat underperforming among younger voters, both in terms of their enthusiasm to vote and even the share of them that now say they're going to vote for him relative, not so much to Trump, but, you know, third parties or don't know. On the other hand, Biden is running better than any Democratic nominee since Al Gore in 2000 among older voters, including older whites. There's no question about that. It's consistent across both state and national polls. And I think that's an advantage that more consistently translates across the states. I mean, if you're running better among whites 50 plus, that not only helps you in aging Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, even Iowa and Ohio, as you know, Al, but it's also a big you know, uh, big deal, as Joe Biden might have said, uh, in Florida and Arizona. And, you know, if you that is the new element that was not there in 2018. I mean, 2018, we saw a very clear erosion for Republicans in white collar suburbs, particularly among women, but also among men all across the country. That is not improved for Trump. And the new element that wasn't there really in 2018 was this uh, weakness and softness among older, uh, older voters, including older whites. And that's where if he and that's where it's not even necessary to win them if you just reduce the margins. And I think, Ron, I mean, tell me if if if, if you agree with this, that among virtually every demographic group, save perhaps young voters, Biden is doing better at this stage than Hillary. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh, and and I say the big thing, you know, if we kind of think of the Trump presidency, uh, the the initial recoil that he faced in his first two years was among some segment of college whites who voted for him in 2016 and felt and felt that, you know, he was a business guy. He had to be more stable than he was letting on. This was all kind of an act. When he got into office, the responsible adults would be in the room. They tame him and channel him. And, you know, you know, all the rest. Uh, And many of them watched the first two years in kind of horror that, uh, you know, not so much in opposition to the policies, the tax cuts in particular, um, but the, the behavior uh, and the volatility. Um, and that translated in 2018 to these sweeping Democratic gains. You know, Al, before the 2018 election, Republicans held 43 percent of the House seats. 
where there, where there were more college graduates than the national average. After the election, they were down to 25 percent of them. So it was a wow. pretty big, pretty sharp movement. And of course, it occurred not only in the places where we have been seeing, we've been watching move toward the Democrats for, for years, Northern Virginia, the suburbs of Philly, uh, New Jersey, the suburbs of Chicago, but Richmond and Dallas and Houston and Atlanta and Salt Lake City. Georgia, yeah. yeah. Georgia. Um, so that, that was very real. That, that was probably the biggest change that powered 2018, mostly among women, but but uh, you know, I, I looked at this in twenty. If you look at the five biggest counties in Texas in twenty twelve, and that's Dallas, Harris, which is Houston, Tarrant, which, Tarrant, which is Fort Worth, Bear, which is San Antonio, and Travis, which is Austin. Those five big counties, Obama in twenty twelve won them by a combined hundred and thirty thousand votes, and that was kind of a big deal. He won Harris County, Houston, by like a vote, and that was like a big deal, a big turning point. Twenty eighteen, Beto O'Rourke won those same five counties by six times as much. He won them by seven hundred and ninety thousand uh, votes. Now. You know, the rural parts of Texas are so Republican that it allowed Cruz to win. But the trajectory is pretty clear. It's possible that Biden could win those five counties, I think, by 900,000 votes or maybe even more. And while also reducing the Republican advantage in the surrounding suburban counties. So you can imagine a scenario where Trump holds on to Texas narrowly by turning out, you know, every possible voter left in rural uh, and East Texas places that James knows pretty well. Um, but uh, but the, the metros, which is where all the population growth is happening, where all the economic dynamism is happening, moves even more sharply against them. Democrats win even more House seat, U.S. House seats. They possibly flip the state house by winning enough state house seats in the suburbs of Dallas and Houston, even if Trump's rural strength allows him to hold the state. This is the, the, the trade Trump is imposing on the Republican Party. I mean, he is, I think, putting them in a position where they are squeezing bigger margins out of shrinking groups at the expense of provoking greater hostility from the growing groups. Well, I know James has a few comments that say, just on Texas, I plan. they have to win, I think, eight seats in that state house. And there are nine seats that either, either Beto or uh, nine Republican House seats that either Beto or Hillary carried in the last two elections. So they got a real shot there. Go ahead, James. So, Ron, if, if I just take my dashboard and my dashboard or polling averages, I get, as you can imagine, I see a lot of polls from around the country. And also, I look at election returns in the past three and a half years. And if, if I had to, if, 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 if I were just saying I'm being very antiseptic, I think he's going to get 42. And mm, wow. give the third party three. So mm -hmm. yeah, that would produce a yeah. 55 42 result. What would that look like across the country? Well, you know, it's interesting, it's interesting you put Biden at 55 because it's certainly been consistent in polling that 55% of the country does not want Donald Trump to be president. Um, and the question has been whether Democrats can consolidate that and they have struggled uh, to do so. Um, 55 42 or even 54 43. Uh, you know, would be obviously the largest victory for either side. Uh, I guess Bush was what fifty three point something in nineteen eighty eight. It would be, it would be since Reagan, I believe. Well, I think Bush was just under fifty four in nineteen eighty eight. Um, but yeah, but there were no third party. Yeah, right. no third party. Uh, anyway, uh, that would be you know that would be a, and that is not inconceivable. I mean, I believe that, you know, if we're saying that, you know, I, I said before, Trump, you know, if he can recover into the 46 range, he can possibly squeeze out the Electoral College again. I don't think he can recover into the 46 range unless he can produce an electorate different than everybody is expecting. I mean, I think I think the his struggles in metropolitan America uh, are such I mean, just 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 for the background here, he lost 87 of the 100 largest counties in America. He lost them by a combined 15 million votes, which is, you know, a pretty breathtaking number. Now, he was able to overcome that by winning 2,600 of the other 3,000. Um, but if you look at those 100 largest counties, they are the places that were hit the hardest by the administration's failure to respond effectively to the coronavirus outbreak. It's still the case that the, 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 the death rates are highest in the most dense metro places. And those are also the places where we've seen the biggest backlash uh, in the aftermath of George Floyd. I think it's entirely possible that um, he loses those 100 largest counties by even more than the 15 million votes that he did in 2016, which says to me that he will need even bigger margins uh, in small town and rural areas. I don't think he can increase his share of the vote very much there. 
And so like, I think there's one path for him, which is just turning out vastly more blue collar evangelical non-urban voters than anybody expects. So I kind of hold that off on the side and not sure even if that's enough. If in fact you would get to something like what James just, just, um, uh, you know, laid out, uh, I think you would see a complete metro collapse for the Republican Party. I think you would, uh, you, you know, you're, what you're already seeing in Iowa, for example, in polling, you know, now, as you guys know, is uh, metro Iowa is turning sharply against Joni Ernst. And I think you would see metro Atlanta. Look at the look at the primary uh, turnout for Republicans and Democrats in Gwinnett County. Gwinnett County, Georgia. That's that's the, that's ground zero. Right. So if that happened, you would see Democrats winning an awful lot of Senate seats. You know, don't forget in 2016, first time in American history, every Senate race went the same way as the presidential in that state. It's not guaranteed, but generally now we're seeing 90 percent of correlation, people voting the same way for Senate as they do for president, maybe even higher. Uh, And so you could imagine metro based Democratic majorities winning Senate seats in Georgia, uh, and Iowa, not to mention North Carolina and uh, Arizona and Colorado, of course, uh, and Maine, maybe even, you know, getting close, probably not winning in Texas again, but possibly winning the state house uh, because you would win so many uh, metro area. Uh, Biden, if, if, you're, if you're up to that level nationally, Biden would be winning so big in the metros, even in Texas, the Democrats could win those seats, even if Trump's rural strength allows him to eke out the state. Question, of course, is how would the Republican Party react to that? Right. I don't see him. Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't see him carrying Texas. You don't see him carrying Texas? Trump? No. No. Yeah. It's too, no. Not really. It's a lot of, you know, those numbers. And remember, in 18, you, you know, Beto's numbers, that was driven by whites. Yep, it was. His young number or, or non-white number was not overly impressive. Or the turnout. Yeah. Right. But, but James, how much would you worry given that turnout given that registration and turnout in minority communities has been very person to person intensive can you really get the engagement you want in the valley if you have to do it all digitally i, I don't know somebody needs to do a consumption study in a democratic party and i mean a really exhaustive consumption study on non whites under 35 mm-hmm. i don't think people have any idea of how to communicate I mean, I've never seen anything anybody talk fresh about because that's where the slack is. If you want to know where the elasticity is in turnout, I think it's in non-white under 35. Yeah, I, you know, I looked at our CNN poll uh, the other day. I had them run for me. The enthusiasm about voting among non-whites under 50 is not high at the moment. I mean, Biden clearly has work to do in convincing those voters that, you know, voting for him would advance any of the things they care about. Now, the contrast with Trump is very clear. I know the groups like Next Gen, America, and others are, are relatively optimistic that they can do that. But if you, I mean, that's the last piece to get to the kind of outcome that you're talking about. Because if you if you have the suburban, you know, you get to a point where, where Biden's winning 60% or plus, maybe plus, 60% or more of non-college white women is splitting or slightly winning non-college white men and is now running uh, winning seniors overall and maybe losing white seniors by only two or three or four points instead of the 20 that Hillary did in 2016, obviously he wins in that scenario. If you add to that a better than expected turnout and return to 60% plus margins among voters under 35, which is not at all inconceivable given that Trump's approval rating and them has struggled to get above 25, 26, you put all that together, then you're in the ballpark for the kind of victory that no longer seemed possible in American politics, given how dug in this is. Any, if any billionaire, please fund this project. Please fund it. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about a huge survey of non-white under 35. You, 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 could, you, could, you could really change the world with that. By the way, if, if, that's, the most, if that's the most movable piece that could, could advantage Democrats, I think the most movable piece for Trump would be returning to some of his cultural themes and trying to drive back some of those whites over 50. I mean, I think the suburban whites are a lost cause. Uh, the ones that are the ones that have moved away from the Republican Party are not coming back. But I mean, there are a lot of white people over 50 uh, uh, who might now be saying they're voting for Joe Biden, who might be receptive to arguments, for example, blaming China for the coronavirus and saying Biden's too close to China or that he is going to open the floodgates to 
undocumented immigrants. I mean, they, they, it's, you know, they, th those voters have not been Democrats for a while. And there are reasons they have not been Democrats for a while, largely cultural reasons. Uh, they don't like Trump. They don't like Dan Patrick and other Republicans saying they have a duty to die so that people can go back to the mall and get their nails done. Um, but it, it seems to me that if there is one piece of the Biden uh, coalition, as we see it stand here in June, uh, that is most vulnerable to kind of a Trumpian counterattack, it would be those those older whites. And by the way, you know, this is kind of a, this is kind of, I think, a one-time, uh, one-time sales offer. I mean, I don't think that there is a long-term movement back among older whites uh, to, to the Democratic coalition. I think, but the contrast between Biden, who is acceptable to them and one of them, uh, and Trump's volatility, and in particular, the way he's handled the outbreak, uh, kind of cre creates this, this unique little window uh, where Democrats can expand the map without necessarily expanding the electorate, which has been the assumption, I think, for many years now. You have to expand the electorate to expand the map. Biden may never do that. Biden may never, James, no matter how much is put into communicating with younger non whites he may never, he may not be the guy to, to pick that lock, but he could easily win anyway by improving just a few points among the older whites who do reliably vote. Well, yeah, yeah, that, it'll be, it's going to be a tough slog, but they, there is some, you know, there's some that didn't vote in 18, that, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of them don't like Republicans, but they like Trump. That, that's, that, that happens. You see some of that. How much? I'm not sure, but I'll agree there's some of that out there. Ron, you wrote the other day that even if Trump loses, he's still going to be a huge force in the Republican Party. You think that'll be the case, even if he would lose decisively the way James just outlined? I think I think the, the 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 quantity, the magnitude of the loss obviously matters. I don't I think Trump is a huge factor, not because of him, but because of the party. I mean, I think that the Republicans are caught in this kind of classic spiral where the voters most alienated by Trump's racial nationalism and his uh, intolerance and his kind of very narrow exclusionary vision, you know, his his his, his stamp on the party, those voters are are leaving and have left the party. And what's left tend to be those who are most okay. And in fact, not only okay with, but excited by uh, that vision. Uh, you know, I, I always go back to this number in a public religion research institute poll last year, two thirds of people who approve of Trump say whites face as much discrimination as minorities. Uh, there's polling from Pew that 80% of Republicans now say that people alleging discrimination where it doesn't exist is a bigger problem than, than not finding it where it does exist. That's the core of the party at this point. And I think no matter how badly Trump does, um, if you want to find, if you want to change direction, you need an electoral base from which a beachhead, from which to launch that counter revolution. Um, and that's not there at the moment. I, you know, I know a lot of more centrist Republicans, their, their universal hope is that if Trump loses, Biden and the Democratic uh, Congress um, impose an agenda that is more left than is acceptable to a lot of those suburban whites, and they come back into the Republican primary in 2024, uh, and that allows the that creates the foundation for an anti-Trumpism. Plus, is Trump going to go away? I mean, he's. I mean, it, it's hard to believe he isn't going to at least dangle the possibility of running again in 2024 if he loses, which he could do. Uh, to keep himself in the news for three years and make it harder for anyone else to emerge, much less anyone to emerge and challenge his vision. But let's let's face it. And, and one final point, there are very few Republicans with credibility to challenge his vision. I mean, they, this has not exactly been a profile and courage for four years. The party has, you know, I think basically said that as long as you win and give us the power to impose the things we want, we will excuse anything you do, no matter how racist, no matter how authoritarian. I mean, it has been, Al, you, you've covered the Republican Party even longer than I have. I mean, it is, it is astonishing to, to watch a major American political party behave in this way. And I, I, don't, I, think, I think it is something out of our experience. I think what we've watched the last three years doesn't even fit with the American political tradition, as uh, Richard Hofstetter would call it. I don't think this is behavior. I mean, I, I don't know what the Lamar Alexanders and the Rob Portmans and, and the others, uh, maybe they don't have a conscience anymore, but you're, you're right. Just one final thing, then back to James. You talked about young Ivy League educated right-wingers like Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley, eyeing 2024, embracing the Trump base, but really running as a respectable version of Trump. That might suggest an oxymoron, kind of like an honest Bernie Madoff. How can you be a respectable right. version of Trump? 
Well, that's the question, right? As someone said to me, they're trying to replace personality with policy. So if you if you have the core elements of Trumpism, you know, hostility to immigration, suspicious of trade, uh, uh, dubious uh, dubious about international alliances, but you don't have the constant belligerence and belittling and the open appeals to racial, racial resentment, it's all a little more buttoned down. Is that sufficient to get you to those elevated super majorities among the constituencies attracted to that? I don't think we know the answer, um, but there's no question. I mean, look, Trump, Trump is on a treadmill. I mean, he and the party is on a treadmill as long as it allows him to define it, which is that, you know, his answer to every problem is to double down on cultural and racial division to try to mobilize more turnout among his base. The treadmill is each time he does that, uh, he reinforces the concerns among not only white collar whites, but also some of the blue collar white women about his personal fitness to be president. And I think you know, the party may discover the flip side of that uh, in, in a Cotton Hawley candidacy, which is that if you if you try to uh, recapture some of the people who have drifted away because they don't like Trump's behavior by being more moderately behaved, do you get the super intensity of commitment on the other side that Trump's breaking of all these windows has engendered? Well, in your recent piece, uh, you quoted Stan Greenberg saying that the, the base voters have gone from 60 to 67 percent of the party because of the exit of a lot of suburban females. So as of now, their their hold on the party is stronger than ever. Now in Wall Street Journal poll, it was only 33% self-identified compared to 45 Democratic, but they might be getting what they want, a smaller, purer party, which means you're not gonna win many elections. Yeah. Whatever happened to that Stan Greenberg guy? Did he ever make anything of himself? Uh, after those, after those focus, I wrote about those focus groups in 1985 in Macomb County that, that you know, that made Stan Greenberg and in many ways, you know, anticipated the modern political world that we, uh, that we live in with, with the, the class inversion. But yeah, I mean, this is, look, I mean, when, when parties, uh, when parties make a, a veer in a direction like this, it is not simple to, uh, simply undo it and reverse them. I, I got one question on this before we leave. It was widely assumed and reported and believed that the country was at, in a, in a loggerheads of 50-50, very few swing voters. It was all about getting the base out. I, I got one word that needs explaining, Michigan, right? I, I did not even c- compete. It's not even gonna, it, it how, in this highly polarized place, you can't tell me people don't change their mind. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I mean, I think that there are, you know, look, this is an extreme case, right? I mean, Trump is such is such a departure or aberration from anything that is anyone who has held that job before in in almost every aspect of of the presidency that it really is kind of the maximum stress on on party loyalty. But having said that, you know. Gretchen Whitmer won Oakland County outside of um, the white collar county outside of Detroit by twice as big a margin as Hillary Clinton did. I mean, people moved, you know, and if Colin Allred and and uh, and uh, and Fletcher down in Texas, you know, they're winning House seats. Democrats have never won that before. There had to be some people who had voted Republican before who voted Democratic Uh, Maricopa County. Right. I mean, Kirsten Sinema won it by 60,000 votes after it was the largest county in America that Trump won. That isn't all just differential turnout. So I do think that, you know, we are going to see uh, that there are limits to uh, party loyalty. You know, again, I don't rule out Trump finding a way to claw back to 45 and making this close in the Electoral College. But right now, you'd have to say the odds of him losing big are higher than the odds of him winning uh, at all. Before you before you exile me, I have to ask you a question, which is who do you guys like for vice president? Oh, I know that we were going to ask you. (laughs) Uh, I, if I had to pick, I would knowing absolutely nothing. If I had to guess right now, I would do the conventional wisdom and say Kamala Harris. But that is based on no reporting whatsoever. I don't care. I, I said on television he picked Sarah Palin. I'd say it's the greatest charge in, in the world. I, I, I'm kind of with you, Al. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, as, as Stan can tell you, Stan Greenberg, I, I have believed since Biden announced that that would be the ticket. Uh, more recently. I had come around to the view that there's a lot of merit in Elizabeth Warren, 
Um, uh, I, I think that Warren, you know, has shown herself to be a good campaigner. She's got a genuine national audience. It would probably excite and surprise the party. Um, but I think after everything that's happened this spring, I mean, how do you not pick an African-American woman? And if you pick an African-American woman, how do you leapfrog over Kamala Harris to someone who has much less national experience? Uh, so, you know, uh, I think, I, you know, I, I thought Biden's personal preference probably would have been Amy Klobuchar and he probably would have been talked out of that. That's obviously been, you know, pushed to the side by by her role in, in, in policing issues in in Minnesota. Um, and I think there is a very strong case for Warren, but I would be surprised if it isn't Kamala Harris. Yeah, the case was stronger before uh, before Minneapolis. Now, now the, the fear, I think, would be if you don't pick an African-American, it would almost look like a rejection. I think he should announce Warren is going to be his attorney general. Yeah, well, I believe he should announce a broad. Can I can I throw in a last thought? I, I wrote a piece about this. You can throw whatever you want. Uh, I, I wrote a piece about this a few weeks ago. You know, Biden. Look, there is only going to be so much enthusiasm and excitement ever about electing Joe Biden as president. Not only because he's seventy-seven, but because he has never been a big, broad, inspirational figure. He has been someone who's been very effective in operating within the four corners of the Senate, but he's not Bill Clinton or Barack Obama. He has never shown, to, I think, I've, I've covered him since his 88 campaign, and he's obviously an incred incredibly decent and empathetic guy, but he's never shown the capacity to fundamentally change the national debate or to kind of think outside of the box. And I, and I, I don't think there's going to be this like, oh boy, we're electing Joe Biden. Where he has been the most effective ever, I thought, is when he talks about himself as a bridge to a new generation of leadership. The last event he did before the coronavirus shut down the campaign, Monday night before the Michigan primary, when he stood on stage with Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, and Gretchen Whitmer, and used that kind of language. And you could kind of envision that you were not just electing Joe Biden, you were uh, calling forth a generational transition in leadership that reflects the diversity of the country in a way that every one of these Trump photo ops surrounded by white men, like the church, uh, uh, with Kaylee as the exception, uh, does not. And so I think that there, there might be value in not only naming his attorney general, but basically saying, look, uh, without getting very specific about jobs, this is my national security team. This is my team that's going to handle the environment and climate change. This is my team that is, you know, it's uh, Sally Yates and Stacey Abrams, and they're going to do criminal justice and voting reform. Uh, uh, I, I think that several people use to me the Avengers as, as kind of the metaphor. Um, you know, Biden as the leader of the Avengers, uh, I think, is more uh, plausible to Americans as a vehicle for change than Joe Biden as the solitary visionary leader, a la the one, as they called Obama or Clinton. Um, I, I just think I just think that's a better look for him. And uh, I know they're very risk averse. Um, and there are lots of reasons why people have not done this. Where they've looked at it, but not done it. But I think there's a case for Biden to surround himself and say, look, you're not just getting me you're getting us. In fact, I said a, a very good slogan for Joe Biden might be not me, us as someone else used in the uh, in the campaign, only with a different only with a different purpose. There are swing voters in the argument. Yeah, there are. There are. And and who knows? Like I said, I mean, you know, telling there's only so much you can do in a vice president. There's no vice president that signals everything to every constituency that you have to speak to. And why stop there? I mean, you know, they, he has some really good you know, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar and Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren and Andrew Yang and Julian Castro and Sally Yates and Stacey Abrams and Susan Rice and Admiral McRaven. And you go through the list uh, and, you know, the ability to uh, reach down to some of the mayors, Garcetti and Bottoms. There is a lot of talent reflecting different experiences, uh, different parts of the country, different ethnic and racial groups. There's a lot of talent out there. And I think putting that in front of the country in contrast to what the Trump administration has been, which is essentially overwhelmingly older white men running things, um, is, I think, a very powerful. And, and I know all the reasons why people don't do it. And it's a pain in the butt. And you got to vet people a little bit in the summer. Um, but I think there's a case for it. Well, you don't even have to specify. You can say you can list 10 or 12 people. That's what that's what Trump yes. did with, uh, with, with the justice. Yeah. I, I think you say, this is my team. This is, this is going to be my national security team, you know, so that Tom Donilon doesn't strangle you for saying it's going to be Susan Rice, the secretary of state, or vice versa. You just say, this is my team. 
you know, and uh, uh, maybe you identify a couple people like Elizabeth Warren as your attorney general, if she's not your vice president. Um, but mostly you say, this is my team and Pete Buttigieg is going to be my UN ambassador. Who better to represent America to the world than a polymath, gay veteran, you know, Rhodes Scholar. So uh, uh, it, I, I think there's I think there's value in that. But, you know, look, he's winning. He seems to be pretty comfortable, you know, letting the clock tick by day by day without, you know, taking a lot of risks. And uh, I, I don't anticipate Joe Biden would do this, but I think uh, many of the people I talked to thought there was a case for it. Well, he doesn't have to announce it ahead of time, but I hope they think carefully about a White House chief of staff, because based on so, so many years here, I am convinced that in some ways that's the single most important uh, task for a new president. Uh, well, is that is that is that Klain or who is that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'll tell you who I would pick. Sylvia Burwell. OK, yeah. Uh -huh. but, you know, uh, he may not be comfortable with that, but it's just it's I mean, Clinton did well when he had a good White House chief of staff. Jim Baker, of course, was legendary. Uh, yes. You know, I think uh, Rahm Emanuel served. Obama very well those first two years as, as kind of a prime minister, you know, as kind of a yeah, legislative prime right. minister, right? So, but we'll see. He Even though he gets, he gets a lot of opprobrium, as you know, from from the left, but you know, Truman, Nixon, Clinton, none of them got their health care bill even to the floor of either chamber, and really it was Rom who cut the deals, who made the ACA possible. Uh, so that alone, whatever else they decided on immigration. Uh, and partially that was Nancy Pelosi. Well, they got the stimulus. Too. Yeah, and, 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 you know, but look, the other, the other thing to keep in mind, one last point um, is that if in fact, uh, you know, one, one thing we didn't discuss is that this Democratic, both parties really, are more homogenous and unified than they were. Uh, you know, this is a very different Democratic Party than the last time they had uh, unified control of government or even the House majority back then and even 09, 10, there were a large number of blue dog and rural Democrats who didn't want to do gun control, who didn't want to do immigration. Many voted against the ACA, more voted against the cap and trade bill in the House. It was a it was a kind of somewhat tenuous urban, suburban, rural coalition. That's gone. I mean, you know, th there are very, very few rural members left. If there is a the Democratic majority is overwhelmingly uh, based in Metro America, everywhere in the country. I mean, every state. Uh, and you saw that and their nine or 10 bills that they voted on there, you know, their H1 through 10. I think they were Al, a total, James, a total of two no votes from Democrats on all 10 bills over the 10 bills. There were two no votes. Um, and that's unprecedented. And so there is the possibility, you know, obviously, if they win in Iowa, it will be because they win Des Moines and the growing suburbs outside Des Moines. And if they win in Georgia, it will be Atlanta and the growing. They, they're, they're, there's not going to be. Uh, Ernest Hollings or John Murtha or Ike Spratt. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, people who are Democrats, but, but, but are responsive to rural constituencies that are dubious about many of the things that the party wants to do other than protect Social Security and Medicare. So, I mean, there, th this, is, this is going to be a very different party. And, and the pressure point will be whether, not so much the cultural issues that divided it in the past, but the spending issues and whether they can hold enough of those suburban whites, particularly men, if they go ahead uh, with the kind of, even the kind of agenda that Biden has laid out. I think the answer is probably yes, but not guaranteed. Yeah, the threat for Joe Biden won't, internal threat won't be from, from the modern day John Murthys, it'll be from the AOCs. Uh, I mean, that's what they have to worry about, but that's down the road. James, a final thought with Ron. Well, no, I mean, I just thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I, I, my best guess, if we went to post today, he'd have 42. And that's not, that's based on everything that I see. And I, I keep questioning myself and questioning myself. And that's where I end up. I hope I'm right, but, but I, I can change. I can definitely change. James, what, how high do you think he has to get to have a chance to win the Electoral College? Yeah, I defer to you, you Nate Cohn, you know. I, yeah, I don't have, I, yeah, I'm not the guy on that either. I, I kind of think, I think the five, the fours and five seems unrealistic to me, given that, but given the point I made before that Biden is strong among older voters and they're everywhere. I don't think a five point loss is going to win Arizona. I don't think, I don't think, I'm just like, I'm, look, I'm just doing a simulation in the back and the third party is a real factor here. When you start talking about that now, they've got six, I think in 16, I, it feels like, three or below. That's one factor we got to 
plug into the equation here because it's going to be significant on the margins. So, but I, 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 I just think it's going to be 55, 42, three. Wow. This, this has been thoroughly enjoyable guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Before we go, Brownstein, one quick question. Will there be a baseball season? I don't think so. Oh, I'm afraid you may be right. Well, also, is it worth it? Like for a, you know, a 55 game season where, uh, they want to play in Arizona and Florida. That ain't happening anymore. Arizona, is you know collapse arizona may be the state that has the hospital collapse that we've all been fearing uh which is interesting given that it may be the state that also picks the president florida is burning out of control right now to, burning very highly at least right now and so i don't see how they do it i don't see why they would do it a 55 game season that no one would treat seriously and you risk mike trout or mookie Betts having an, an illness that could change their lung capacity for the rest of their lives i i wouldn't do it ron brown seeing you're the best uh other, except you married above yourself. So say hi, Eileen. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, guys. James, we did okay by ourselves today. We sure did. We sure did. All right. Well, you be safe out there, okay? Will do. All right, good. And I want to thank everybody for listening to 2020 Politics War Room and follow the show on Twitter at Politics War Room. You also can email us, uh, politicswarroom at gmail.com. Uh, it's politicswarroom at gmail.com. And if you have a comment or question for us, let us know what you think of the show. Thanks for subscribing, and please tell all of your neighbors from a safe distance, of course. James, you be safe, and we'll talk to you again next week.